We're back for your ears only. I'm Mark Garber. I'm David Alpern with this quote from the news. A comprehensive condemnation of the CIA, the Black Site program, and Poland's role in it. That was Joseph Margulies, lawyer for one of two terrorism suspects, after the European Court of Human Rights ruled against Poland for allowing their transfer to a secret CIA site for torture. It was the first such case of European complicity the court has taken up. Now this. I don't know what happened. We were sleeping. Our house completely collapsed on us. It's morally, morally wrong to kill your own people. Whole world is, has been watching, is watching with great concern. You must stop fighting and enter into dialogue. Sirens over Tel Aviv, the survivor of a bombing in Gaza, and U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon after the attack on a U.N. school that killed at least 15 Palestinians sheltering there, many of them children. With the death toll among Palestinians approaching 1,000 compared with 35 Israelis, much of the media coverage began to suggest overkill on the part of Benjamin Netanyahu's government. Rejecting the urgent plea from U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry for a week-long humanitarian ceasefire, Jerusalem did announce a 12-hour lull during which it would continue its search-and-destroy campaign against Hamas tunnels into Israel. For an on-scene view of the situation, for your ears only, we turn to Dasi Berkowitz, an American Jewish educator and program director, recently relocated to Jerusalem with her husband, Rabbi Leon Morris, and three young children. Welcome to the program. Thank you. When did you and your family arrive in Israel? So we arrived um, just a month ago, and it was right around the time that the three uh, teenage boys were kidnapped, um, Naftali, Gilad, and Ayal. And, um, and you know, things were, were tense here. Um, when we arrived, a, a friend of mine commented that, you know, things are tense, please bring some joy. So um, we we're very happy to do that. You know, this is a big uh, change for our family and really a dream of ours to make the Jewish homeland our home. Um, and uh, and so we were, we were full of, of energy when we first arrived. And I think what we sensed immediately was really the solidarity among um, among Israelis. How has the conflict affected the lives of your husband, your children, and yourself? So we've had three sirens in Jerusalem, and thank God for the Iron Dome missile defense system, um, which has been amazing at really defending against any major damage, certainly here in Jerusalem. Um, you know, the South has been a little bit um, stronger hit. But we've, um, uh, we've um, you know, uh, one of the most startling uh, of the sirens was um, on a Saturday afternoon, a Shabbat afternoon, when we were having a picnic lunch, and um, all of a sudden the siren went off, and we quickly took shelter in a neighboring um, apartment building. And what was amazing was, you know, a woman from the building who came and was at the door and saw us running with our children and um, and beckoned us in, and we all kind of hung out in the in the shelter. Um, all Israeli apartment buildings are built with um, miklatim or or bomb shelters, because um, sadly this happens too often. Um, but we try to normalize it as much as we can, you know, singing the itsy bitsy spider calms uh, tensions. And I think when you're a parent, you realize that when you have the responsibility for calming your kids, it enables you to really calm yourself. You write about peace marches and joining gestures of Jewish Arab unity, but also about the needs of the hour as Israel's armed forces target tunnels, uh, the rocket arsenals, and launching capabilities of Hamas. Do you see this military goal being achieved on a permanent basis, or or at least for a substantial period of time, or, or just in the cyclical way the conflict has surged and subsided for years? You know, sadly, there is really a cycle of violence um, here, and um, we've, um, you know, I was speaking to a rabbi here, Tamara Elad Applebaum, who says, you know, there's a, a cycle of violence, and then, um, but what we really need is visionary leadership and even regular civilians who can have faith and kind of jump beyond the cycle and see the bigger picture. So I think that. You know, I, I think this isn't going to end the conflict and the conflict in the Middle East. I, it, you know, I would hate to say that it's a permanent one. Um, you know, the faith side of me says that there will be peace one day, um, but I think it takes a lot of smart people to to um, think creatively and to really dream big to make that happen. 
You also write of the smart, talented, educated people of Gaza you met during a more hopeful period and wish they had produced the kind of Palestinian leadership that values state building and civil society. The suggestion seems to be that they could have created a firewall against Hamas extremism. But the critics say such leaders could not succeed because Israeli policies precluded the kind of economic and social development that might eventually have rallied the so-called Arab street. So, you know, I think I would look back to nine years ago when Israel uh, evacuated Gaza and we left um, agricultural um, industry and other industries there. And, you know, our goal, you know, it's a small neighborhood. Our goal is really to have Gaza thrive um, socially, economically, um, politically, um, with a peaceful Gaza, um, Israel can thrive. You know, there would be could be a ton of commerce going back and forth. You know, this was uh, Shimon Peres's dream um, of the Middle East and the New Middle East. So, you know, I'm a, I'm an optimist. I'm not a pessimist, um, and I think that there certainly is a sense of radicalism that um, you know that has led to the popularity of Hamas. Um, and, um, but I don't think that those are the only voices, you know, I think that there are plenty, plenty of people who want to live, um, good, happy lives and provide for their children and their families, um, and would be willing to do so, but they're shouted out by, um, extremist elements. Even some Jewish critics of the Netanyahu government say it has already lost the war for international public opinion. The number of fatal accidents, if that's what they really were, is growing daily, and the toll of civilian Palestinian dead and wounded is just so much greater than that on the Israeli side. Do you fear that the image of Israel as underdog David is morphing into that of a cruel giant Goliath? You know, I think that... um Public opinion, um, you know, I think the news and the media is so quick, you know, now, and um, pictures paint a thousand words, 100%. Um, but I think we really need to be attuned to nuance um, and, and listening and, and hearing. And if you're only hearing one story, to listen for more and more stories, I think, on both sides. I think the loss of life is tragic. Um, but I also think that we need to remember that um, the Israeli army is, this isn't a war that they're looking for. Um, the Israeli army has done what it can to try to get the, um, to warn civilians to evacuate their homes. So I think that we really need to, to be careful of what we're listening to and hearing. We need to remember that um, you know, Israeli values are American values, um, due process, you know, certainly things go wrong in the IDF and not everything is, you know, picture perfect and that those um, incidents are reported and they are evaluated and, um, you know, and, and, uh, and that there's, you know, due process, freedom of press, all of that. So I think that um, before we're so quick, um, you know, um, of, of lambasting Israel for being the giant Goliath, I think we need to be more attuned. But I mean, it pains me as a mother, you know, to, um, but there is so much loss of life. Um, and we, you know, please God pray for the, the end of this conflict and the ceasefire um, very soon. Dazi Berkowitz is an American Jewish educator and program director recently relocated to Jerusalem with her husband, Rabbi Leon Morris, and three young children. Quote from the news, we're lucky they just put flags up there and not a bomb. That was a New York City law enforcement official after the discovery that two giant American flags on the Brooklyn Bridge had been replaced unnoticed one night with bleached white banners as a prank or a comment on national cowardice. Next, another blow to Obamacare and other domestic developments for your ears only.